G'day, how y'all going? If you're new here, my name is Tech. Welcome to my channel, Bootlosophy. And as usual, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of Wajak country, the lands on which I live and work. In this video, I'm looking at uh, these Fred country boots from Grenson, the English footwear company out of Northampton. Grenson is a British footwear manufacturer with a long history dating back to 1866. The company was founded by William Green in Northamptonshire, England, a region known for its rich history in shoemaking. Grenson began as a small family-run business producing high-quality handcrafted shoes for men. Grenson shoes are known for their durability, comfort and timeless style, and they have been worn by a couple of people you may have heard of like Winston Churchill and the former Prince of Wales, now King Charles. After the Second World War, its fortunes started to wane like many other Northampton brands that had to cope with cheap imports. After a long downward spiral, the CEO, Tim Little, was asked by the owners to take over the company and subsequently by 2010, he had full ownership and was also its creative director. As many old heritage brands found, they relied on old successes and forgot about design. So Little stripped down everything old fashioned and irrelevant in his own words and put in a design culture. He has since led it to become a well-known and respected brand and has been credited with expanding the company's reach and modernizing its designs while still maintaining its classic English quirky aesthetic. The company is still based in Northamptonshire. Uh, today, their boots and shoes are split into three categories, uh, costing from under £200 to nearly £500. G0 and G1 footwear are made in their Northampton factory, with the difference between G0 and G1 being in the quality of materials and uh, that final finishing. For example, G1 has an open channel Goodyear welted sole, where you can see the stitches in the outsole, uh, and G0 uses closed channel where the stitches are hidden under a split lip in the, in the sole. G2 is made in India, uh, but little is at pains to explain that all the design, patterns and leather sourcing is made in Northampton and then manufactured in an Indian Goodyear welting factory. He emphasizes that the Indian factory even involves more handmade processes simply because they don't have the machinery. This model, called the Fred, is a G2 product. As you can see, it's a stocky, chunky, a chunky English country boot. It's very similar to Tricker's Stowe boot because it belongs to that same family, first made by Tricker's and then followed by other Northampton boot makers in the mid-1800s. The English country boot was made for tramping in the English country when gentlemen visited their country residences to hunt and shoot. Originally a waterproof boot, it started to be combined with Scottish and Irish farming brogue boots so that the modern country boot design incorporates brogue and wingtip patterns. The original purpose of all that broguing being to allow water to leave the boot so that it wouldn't soak your feet in a collecting pool inside. The Fred Boots broguing is big and generous, including the pattern of the rosette on the toe. The panels are pinked so that the edges of the panels look serrated. It's six inches in height and set on a chunky triple layer sole with a block heel and a storm welt. This one is in tan with hand burnished detailing on the toe and on the heel. While I think it looks quite sleek and elegant, it's also clearly chunky and so looks uh, also quite aggressive as an outdoor boot. Which makes pairing it with outfits quite interesting. Men in England will wear brogue boots with a suit and this tan leather will go well with grey and blue suits paired with either a conservative white shirt and tie, uh, or with striped or pain-checked dress shirts. You can also, of course, go halfway formal and wear it with odd trousers or chinos, with a blazer or sports coat, and it would become a business casual boot. Due to its outdoor origins, you can also pair it with something way more casual, say looser moleskin trousers uh, and a casual button-down Oxford cloth shirt. Definitely, you can also pair it with earth-toned five-pocket pants in tan or green, uh, as well as jeans, and then you lay your outfit with leather jackets or waxed waterproof jackets. Taking a look at the construction, 
It uses the Goodyear welded method of construction where the uppers are attached to the sole using a 360 degree Goodyear storm welt. You can check out my video uh, up there explaining Goodyear welts, but basically it's a strip of leather going all the way around the circumference of the boot. On the inside, the insole is sewn onto the welt and on the outsole, a stitch goes through the welt, through the midsole and the outsole. This makes the boot water resistant because no uh, stitching goes all the way through the boot from outside to inside. This also makes the boot resolable because your cobbler can cut that stitch and remove the outsole to replace it without disturbing anything else. In this case, the welt is a storm welt in that there is a flange that gets pushed up against the side of the boot, uh, thus making it even more water resistant. The outsole is a triple layer sole. The most outer layer is an oak tanned piece of leather. Then there is a slip sole just under that, which is made of rubber for shock absorption. And then there is another leather midsole. The fourth layer you see at the edge is actually the welt, which is a thick welt. The leather outsole is nearly five millimeters thick. The rubber slip sole is about another five millimeters thick. The leather midsole is around three millimeters thick and the welt which is another three or four millimeters thick, combined to give you the impression of a heavy, thick-soled shoe. In fact, each boot only weighs 620 grams, or that's about one and a half, uh, one and a third pounds even, which is pretty light for a Goodyear welted leather-soled boot. Uh, the heel is stacked real leather with a rubber layer just below the top lift, which is leather, uh, with a corner cut out for a rubber insert. Some people may not like the leather insole, but I find it breathable and flexible and it just feels good under your feet. Yes, it can definitely be slippery, uh, but less so once you've properly broken in and scratched it up. Only once it finds grip by getting all scratched up, it gets to look pretty dirty. Can't have everything. <laughs> Moving on up inside the boot, uh, that uh, thicker welt going around the edge of the boot obviously creates a cavity inside. This is filled with cork. On top of that is a leather insole and a non-removable comfort leather sock liner that goes all the way from the heel to the toe. This cork and leather combination is the gold standard for heritage boots and can be extremely comfortable and breathable. Continuing on upwards, this Fred boot is in tan, full grain calfskin leather. I think it's uncorrected full grain because I can see all kinds of subtle texture on the surface. It is very soft and supple and very comfortable once broken in. There is a celastic stiffener in the toe box, uh, not particularly stiff. The heel counter is also celastic, a bit thicker, uh, both of which help you uh, to reduce the weight, of course. At the back, the heel counter cover is decorative because the celastic heel counter is actually inside, covered up by the lining. Uh, there's also a thin back strip going up the back to cover the seam, and at the top, uh, there's a cotton cloth webbing pull tab which is useful and also discreet because it tucks away and doesn't get caught up in your trouser hem. As I mentioned, the brogue holes are big and the brogue panels are pinked. The toe and heel are hand burnished. There are seven fully backed uh, black eyelets that are generous so you can put through some thick laces like on here which I, I think uh, suit the look. The tongue is ungusseted but it doesn't seem to slip on my foot, not yet anyway. Perhaps it's the thickness of the leather, which is about two millimeters thick all over, uh, plus a one millimeter thick lambskin lining. The boot is fully lined with that very soft lambskin. Overall quality control is pretty good. Uh, don't worry about made in India. These are put together quite well. There is not a single loose stitch or any wayward stitching uh, throughout the boot. Every piece of leather is well cut, well chosen, there are no ugly wrinkles, uh, as you can see, despite the suppleness at the vamp and the ankle. The soles and heels are well put together and they are solid. Granson sell a range of leather care products and uh, for the calfskin leather, they suggest you clean it using their William Green's cleaning tonic to remove dirt and stains and then moisturize it with their factory cream polish. I think you can quite easily use Venetian shoe cream as a conditioner. That's my condition of choice for smooth leathers. And then if you want a more lustrous polish, hit it with a good neutral cream polish. Grenson suggests that you brush and polish it every three or four wears. 
I would be very careful of using oils on this leather because I think oils would darken the creamy yellow tan. I'd also be careful using cleaners with alcohol uh, because of the hand burnishing. The alcohol or any uh, heavily petroleum-based content might just wipe off that burnishing. As for sizing, uh, they use the UK sizing numbers and they run a half size large. So UK sizing numbers are one number down from US sizing numbers. On a Brannock device, I'm a US 8.5 in D width. That means I'm a UK 7.5 in average width. Usually in most American boots, I have to size down by a half to an 8D. These boots are in UK 7 average width and they are a perfect fit. Now, a word about UK width denomination. Prepare to be baffled. Granson, like RM Williams, call their average width a G width. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any widespread agreement about those letters used by different bootmakers. Some UK manufacturers, for example, design their average width and call it an H width, and some even call it a C width. If you're not sure, check. In terms of comfort, these provide really snug but comfortable fit. The last is reasonably wide at the ball of the feet, but it is snug at the heel. The rounded toes don't squish your little toes in like some sleek boots, although there's not really spare room to wiggle your toes. Uh, they just seem anatomically proportioned and, and fit my feet quite well. Shock absorption, uh, absorption is pretty good, and so is arch support. I don't wear these very often, but when I do, these are one of my most comfortable boots that I could wear all day. The Grenson Fred boots lists at 440 euros or about uh, 670 odd, 673 Aussie dollars or about, I think that's 480 US dollars thereabouts. That's not cheap, but they do pop up on some Australian online websites at around 400 to 500 dollars. They are a great boot, but to be honest, I think at over 600 Australian dollars, they're a little overpriced. If you can get them for around 500 dollars or less, that's not bad. They are good quality and they have a heritage name. At around $500, they compare with American boot brands that you can get in Australia, like Parkhurst, Truman and Grant Stone, landed in Australia. And in my opinion, they compare well in that price and quality range. As a quaint, british style and versatile boot, at that price, I'd be happy. Well, I hope you liked the review. Let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, don't forget to click on the like button, please. That really would help me out. And of course, if you're not subscribed, click on the subscribe button. Do you know, nearly 70% of viewers who watch my videos keep coming back, but they have not subscribed. So come on, subscribe and help me grow my channel. There's going to be a lot more boot reviews and brand comparisons, as well as some upcoming best of. So subscribe and don't miss out. Look, until the next time, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon.